This conference will now be recorded. Well, so thanks very much for joining us today and um, for a journey through the dunes, our coastal wildlife. And um, this is part of celebrating this year's National Marine Week. Um, I'm Eve Mulholland, I'm the People Engagement Officer for Dynamic Dunescapes Cumbria and today we have Sarah Darimple and Richard Stoughton joining us today. Sarah, if you'd just like to say a quick hello. Yeah, hello, um, I'm Sarah Dalrymple, I'm the Warden at South Bowling Nature Reserve. So today on the talk, we're going to be talking all about the wildlife on our dunes. I'm just going to introduce Dynamic Dunescapes as a project to start with. So Dynamic Dunescapes is a national project restoring sand dunes across England and Wales, targeting some of the most important sand dune systems for the benefit of wildlife, people and communities. For dunes to be healthy, sand needs to be free to move and be dynamic to support the wildlife that, that lives there. So throughout the project, we'll be working from local to national experts with schools, groups, volunteers, families, visitors of all ages and backgrounds to help rejuvenate our dunes for the wildlife that lives there. The project will be working across nine key areas across England and Wales, covering 34 sites in total. That's totaling 7,000 hectares of sand dune systems. And here in Cumbria, the project will be targeting 11 sites from Green Point and Marlborough Banks up at Silleth, down Copeland, including Drigg, Esmeels and Haverig, Barrow Borough, including Ronhead and Sandscale Hawes, Walney Island, including North Walney, West of Airfield, South of Walney, Nick, Reserve and we are also working at Fleetwood in Lancashire too. So why sand dunes then? So sand dunes are listed as the habitat most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss. This is because only 20,000 hectares remain in England and Wales and since the 1900s Wales itself has lost 60% of its sand dune systems. As we know, um, sand dunes are a sanctuary to wildlife, um, including 72 important sand dune species. They're also important for histories, they're important for us too in terms of recreation and health and well-being. However, they have been identified as a 2020 priority habitat. And this is because over time, over many decades, sand dunes have become overgrown with vegetation and have stabilised, putting the special species that live there at risk. So over time, the advice on how to conserve dunes and how to manage them has changed. So part of this project will be implicating new strategies to help the sand dune systems for the benefit of the future. The project will be working to restore 35% of the total sand dune systems. So that's 35% making them in healthy, favourable conditions for the species, supporting 33 of the 72 species that live there. And throughout the three years of the project, we'll be piloting and sharing best practice to ensure sustainability. So sand dunes are part of a large coastal dynamic habitat. Um, it supports a whole range of variety of plants and animals. And sand dunes start their life as a singular grain of sand which is pushed up by the waves and onto the shore. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah who's now going to talk a little bit about our coastal wildlife um, at the forefront of our dunes. Thanks Eve. Um, if I can go to the first slide. So looking at the, the species that use the beaches and the front four of the dunes and um, mammals that spend a lot of life on the beach are pinnipeds, that is seals. In the UK, our most common species are common seal and grey seal. We also get things like bearded seal, hooded seal and walrus, but very rarely. Go to the next slide, Eve. Eve. Thank you. Uh, so looking at grey seals, which is the species that uses the sandy beaches at South Walney, the UK has about a third of the world's population of grey seals. So we've got about 120,000 grey seals in British waters, and that's up from 500 in the early 1900s, which really highlights the benefit of protecting species and stopping hunting. Go on the next slide. So here at South Walney, we've got a haul out. That's a rest site for this species. So they're present here throughout the year, but it is in autumn when things start to get really interesting with the species. Go on the next one, Eve. So the females have spent all summer eating and um, they feed on things like fish, shellfish, um, things like starfish. The females spend all summer eating and getting nice and fat and ready to give birth in the autumn. If you have the next slide. 
So they give birth to a tiny little pup, he's about 14 kilos, um, and just skin and bone when he's born, but fed on his mum's milk, which is over 50% fat, they get really, they fatten up really quickly, if you show you the next slide. So you can see that's just a fortnight later, they've gotten nice and chubby, and they put on about two kilos a day. Um, and then after just about three weeks, um, the mother leaves them, and that's it, and that's all the care she gives to the pup. So if you do the next slide, you see they start to molt out of that white warm fur and into waterproof fur. Next slide. And once they have that waterproof fur, then after a few days, they start to get really hungry and they head up into the sea to find their own food. So if we have the next slide. So here at South Romney, we've had we've seen grey seals here sporadically since um, since the 70s and 80s, but over the past decade the numbers have really increased, and we had we counted nearly 500 last year, which is phenomenal. And in 2015 we had the first pups born here, so we're not really sure why the colony's grown so much and so fast, um, but it's obviously it's a good site for them and they like it here. So if you have the next slide. One of the interesting things about the seals is that the pattern of spots on their coat, um, it helps us identify the individuals. So the top picture here is the first mum who um, first had a pup at South Raleigh in 2015. And we could see she came back in 2017 to pup again, and she's probably been back since. Um, and now we have around a dozen pups last year, and we're really established as a breeding colony for this species, um, and the only breeding colony for this species in Northwest England. So the sandy shorelines, we've gone to the next slide, the sandy shorelines also make a great nest site for ground nesting birds. Um, they like to have the excellent views so they can see danger approaching and it's handy for food out in the sea and the intertidal. So a couple of birds that nest in the dunes at South Walney are ringed plover and the next slide. This is oyster catcher and um, so they nest around here. Now they nest directly on the ground, if you show the next slide. There's an oyster catcher nest. As you can see, it's incredibly well camouflaged and they don't create much of a nest at all. So very, very vulnerable. Do you have the next slide, please? So the chicks hatch and within a day, they're up and about. Um, this is a ring plover and her chick. Um, and they run around after mum and dad who help them find food. And again, that makes them very vulnerable. They can't fly for quite a while yet while they're running around. Do you have the next slide? Another bird that nests on the beaches around South Romney are terns. There's four species of terns that nest in Britain, um, of which the Arctic and the little tern are the ones we have around here. Um, it, again, they like nesting it on the ground. They like the sea views. They like the handy food opportunities out at sea. This is an Arctic tern uh, with the red bill and the long tail streamers. It's probably most famous for having the longest migration of any bird in the world. If you go to the next slide. So every winter they'll fly from Northern Europe all the way to Antarctica and back, which is a journey of about 44,000 miles. And these birds live nearly 30 years. So that one Arctic tern in its life will fly the same distance as to the moon and back three times, which is pretty incredible. If you have a look at the next slide. So the other important tern species we have are little tern. This is our second rarest seabird. It's a little bit smaller. It doesn't have quite as long a migration. And it's got the yellow bill there. And again, they nest on the ground. If you have a look at the next slide. And you can see that's a, that's a new, recently hatched, probably about a day old chick and its sibling still in the egg. And you can see there's hardly, pretty much not a nest at all there. Um, and again, just show you how vulnerable they are. So both these tern species that nest on the beaches, if you have a look at the next slide. The, the chicks stay around the area and the adults bring them food, little fishes like clupids and sand eels. Um, and obviously nesting on the ground, all these species really vulnerable to disturbance. Um, and the next slide will show that quite clearly. Okay, yep, so we've got a little turn nest there. And just to the right, you can see there's a trap from a quad bike that has missed that nest by about a few couple of inches, which I think really brings home how vulnerable those species are. Thank you, Eve. Thanks very much, Sarah. So as we as we move into the dunes, the sand is blown across the shingle where you've got obviously your terns nesting and your oyster catchers and your seals resting on the shoreline there. The sand blows across the shoreline and it'll get trapped by obstacles above the strand line. 
This is where your stand starts to build and your embryo genes begin to form. And these are really important habitats where your pioneer species and specialized species um, start to colonize. And one of those species is your marum grass. It re has really long fibrous roots and it grows as fast as the sand builds. This enables the sand dune systems to form and develop into your mobile dune systems, where you'll get lots of open patches of bare sand, which makes it quite a dynamic and changeable system for areas of specialized vegetation and different species as well. So here in Cumbria, we are lucky enough to have the northern dune tiger beetle. This is possibly one of the fastest insects in the world traveling at about 2.5 meters per second. It's one of five tiger beetle species found in the UK, but the northern dune tiger beetle is highly specialized and restricted to these mobile sand dune systems. It's recorded in only two sites in the UK, so it's found on the Sefton coast and we are lucky to have it on the Drig Dunes 2 here in West Cumbria. So it's right at its northernmost end of its range here, therefore it's a very vulnerable species. It's classed as a red listed species and it's also in the Section 41 Priority Species Act. So the tiger beetle lives in the mobile dunes within crescent shaped burrows in the sand and it's often active around this time of year between about April and October but requires very specific body temperatures to actually be able to function. So you'll, they'll often find they'll burrow to warm up um, if they need to or they'll find they'll take flight or even hide in the marum grass to cool down. But once conditions are right, you will see them out on the dunes uh, trying to catch their prey. So they run really fast along the dunes. They're not apt flyers at all, but they will scurry. And you'll see just in the centre of the picture, they have quite large mandibles to be able to catch their prey. And their eyes are very specially adapted to be able to hunt during the day in the bright sunshine so they can cope with high levels of light intensity. So dune tiger beetles are about two centimetres, they're quite a large beetle and they can live for around about two years. So the adults will lay their eggs in the sand um, and the, the larvae have a several life stages. So the egg will hatch and develop and the larvae will burrow right down straight into the sand. So they've adapted to have really flat heads to be able to excavate these vertical burrows on flat sand about 20 to 30 centimetres deep. And the larvae will hide at the bottom of these burrows and wait for prey to fall in into these holes. And they'll ambush the prey using little hooks on the back legs to stabilise them around its burrow to be able to eat its prey. So they're quite specific creatures, for the northern dune tiger beetles. They require very flat areas of sand to be able to dig their burrows um, to, to stop it from risk of collapsing. And like us, they like the south-facing places. So like we like our south-facing gardens, they quite like warmer areas too, which are a little bit more sheltered. But your sand lizards are one of the species that predate the northern dune tiger beetle. Unfortunately, we don't tend to have these recorded here in Cumbria, but you do find native populations down in Surrey and Dorset and often on the Sefton coast too. However, they have been introduced successfully throughout northern Wales and even Scotland and Ireland and Scotland up there. And what they'll do, they'll emerge from hibernation around about March time and the emerging fertile, so the males especially, they require a lot of different topographic features with different aspects in the dune system. So they can spend their days in the sunshine as much as possible to warm up until they do become fertile. The females will lay around six to 12 eggs, sometimes two batches a year, and they can live for 12, spe 12 years. However, these species also require the mobile dune habitats too, so they are a priority species. Other amphibians that we get on the dunes include the great crested newt, the common frog, the common toad, and the natterjack toad, which Richard will talk, be talking about a little bit later. So on the dune systems, there are many specialized plants and wildflowers, and these tend to live just above the strand line where there's lots of, lots of open sand and within the far dunes, the mobile dune systems as well. In sandscale halls alone, there have been over 600 vascular plant species recorded. This might include your sea holly, for example, which is quite popular, the one in the bottom left picture below. This has, this has really long roots to help it 
anchor it into the ground, thick succulent leaves to absorb any, to hold any moisture, the prickly to stop any rodea from eating it, but especially adapted to still allow the pollinators to come into the flower head. You might also find prickly salt work, work around here as well, which lives on your strand line too. And this is priority species alongside your seaside sanctuary, which you can see in the top left hand side, which is this pink flower here. And this is nationally scarce across the whole of the country, but you can find it quite often in the dunes around here too. Your Isle of Man cabbage, which is this yellow wildflower in the centre of the image, this is, this is a rare species and it can only be found across 22 localities in the whole of the UK. It's endemic to the British Isles. Um, it's at serious risk of extinction, this species, and that's because of population collapse. But for unknown reason, nobody really knows why exactly that is. However, you can find it up on the Silworth coast at Marbury Banks and around the Barrowborough area too. And finally, this, this species, I think lots and lots of local people will know this one, is the Walney geranium. And, um, and it's related to the bloody cranes bill, which you can just about make out a, a much more magenta coloured flower here. Well, this is native to Walney Island, can be found up and down the coastline on Walney and, and at North Walney Nature Reserve too. As you move into the dunes, as more plants grow uh, and die down, the dunes become much more nutrient rich. So you'll find there's less bare sand and it's much more populated with a wider variety, a variety of more species. So here, over 200 species of fungi can be found. Um, you'll find puffballs at this time of year, all sorts of species. But one to look out for is the very, very, very rare tiny earth star, which is a really small, um, small fungi species. Out on the dunes at the moment, uh, it's covered in purple, and that's your wild thyme. Also got bird's foot trefoil, but you need to watch where you step as well, because at the moment there's lots of labyrinth spiders about. Um, these build a really thick white cobweb across the dune systems with a hole in the bottom of it. You can't miss them, they're, they're everywhere at the moment. And what they'll do, they'll lay their eggs right deep down within that hole, and they'll also take the prey down there to feed on. So within your dune system, you have your dune slacks too. Now these form as the wind blows, they are eroded further and further away. So eventually the dune slacks will reach your water table at the bottom. So these are areas that often hold pools of water and damp, generally damper, damper conditions throughout. And these are important places for many, many specialised species, including invertebrates, such as your dragonflies. You've got your ruddy darted and your black-tailed skimmers, which what you can see one just at the bottom left there. They're also really important for your moths and butterflies. You can find your bee fly, which is a nationally scarce species here, and many hymenoptera, including your wasps and solitary bees. So your forefront of your dunes along your strand line and your mobile dunes are really important for your specialised species, but your dune slacks are too. And this is where you find a lot of your orchid species as well. So your round win leaved wintergreen, this is a very localised species to dune slacks and it's a really tall orchid um, that you can find at North Walney. But one of the most, well, we have one of the largest populations of coral root orchids in the country here around, around Cumbria. And that's shown in the, in the middle picture there at the bottom. And coral root gets its name as it traps energy from nutrients which come from fungi that live on its root in a mass at the bottom of its stem. So it's dependent on the fungi to live, go, to, to live because it doesn't necessarily photosynthesize and it's a self-pollinating species too. But around the June slack uh, come springtime, you might find your northern marsh orchids and early marsh orchids and these bloom a little bit earlier than some of the other orchids which I've just mentioned. And also in the bottom right hand side, you can see the pyramidal orchid. This is pollinated by your butterflies and moths and can be found across the dune system. And there's many out at Sandscale Halls at the moment. And the pollen of this flower is specially adapted to the shape to fit the shape of the proboscis of other pollinators too. And one of the most rare species that we have in our dune slack systems is the dune helleborine. And we have the largest and possibly one of the only populations of dune helleborine in the country. And this is a nationally rare species. It can easily be mistaken by another species, um, marsh helleborine too. 
And all across our dune systems, uh, they're really important for many ground nesting birds too, from your shingle, your nesting birds on your shingle, through to nesting birds in the dunes as well. And birds such as the skylark, you have stone chats, and you also see wagtails or eiders even nesting in the pools within your dune systems. So I'm going to hand over to Richard now, who's going to talk a little bit about Natterjack toads and the conservation that will be happening on our dunes. Okay, can you hear me now, Eve? Perfect, thanks, Richard. Uh, my name's Richard Stott, and I'm the Cumbrian Dynamic Duneskates Project Officer. Um, I oversee works on nine of the 11 Cumbrian sites, and uh, we're currently carrying out capital works to combat stabilisation on the dune systems and restore priority habitats. The, the species in the slide that we've got up now is uh, probably familiar to quite a few people. It's a natterjack toad. In Britain, natterjack toads are mainly confined to coastal sand dunes and grazing marsh and sandy heaths after declining rapidly in the last century. Natterjacks are often associated with ponds in the in the sand dune slacks as they require warmer shallow water to breed successfully the cumbrian coast the merseyside and the scottish solway coast are some of the, the best national populations of natterjack toad natterjacks have a thin, bold yellow stripe down the middle of the back, and they are smaller than the common toad, have shorter legs on which they walk rather than hop. The name comes from the man when he's trying to attract a mate. Please. Next slide, Eve, please. In the breeding season, the jack switches between April and July, Males call from the edges of the pools at night. Can can everyone please mute the, the microphones, please? And each female lays, lays eggs as two spawn strings, and the eggs form a single string in each row. Tadpoles develop quickly into toadlets, which then display the yellow stripe down. And the back. Natterjacks also need bare sand to dig hibernation tunnels and natterjacks are protected by British and European law. It's an offence to kill, injure, disturb or capture them. <clears throat> so why, why are sand dunes at risk? Primarily, they're at risk due to stabilisation and loss of bare sand uh, and dynamic sand, loss of moving sand. Um, they're the, the habitat most at risk in Europe for, from biodiversity loss because of this. And the reasons behind that are primarily a lack of grazing, um, loss of rabbit populations as part of that, shifts in, in farming methods um, with cattle not being grazed on the dunes as much. Uh, there's uh, increasing rainfall and reduced winds, uh, nitrogen deposition and changes in management generally. And a combination of all these factors has, has led to the dunes being the most risk habitat in Europe for biodiversity loss. Okay, next slide please, Eve. These two slides are of a site in Cumbria, some scale holes, which may be familiar to, to some people. The slide on the left is from 1946 and the red areas highlighted in that area are the areas of bare sand. And less than 70 years later, um, you can see, or more than 70, just over 70 years later, you can see on the 2018 slide that the bare sand has virtually disappeared. And this this phenomenon is is typical of virtually every sand dune site in the country. Uh, they're all suffering from the over overstabilisation and lack of bare sand. And we're going to look at the, the reasons for that in the next few slides. This slide is just back behind the, the four dunes at Sandscale Hose. And, and this is what overstabilisation looks like. You get a build-up of rank grass and then scrub starts to uh, encroach into that. And if, if that was left unchecked over a, uh, a period of 10 or 20 
is it would eventually turn into woodland. Um, so you, you can see that the dunes are at risk to this, uh, this over stabilization and the project I'm working on, uh, the Dynamic Dukes project has been set up to try and combat these, uh, this over stabilization. Okay, Eve. So, what conservation actions are we are we going to carry out to try and uh, combat this over stabilisation? Um, across most sites in Cumbria, uh, as we said, there's a lack of bare sand, so we're going to try and combat that by a, a variety of methods, which we'll look into a bit a bit later. There's also been a build up of as part of the scrubbing over of the sand dunes, a build up of invasive species that are non-native. So we're, we're going to look to, as part of the capital works, to remove these non-native species, but also uh, native scrub as well. Um, we're going to look to restore the sand dune slacks and the pools and create new ones if there's an opportunity to do that. As part of this work, we're going to in introduce grazing back to sand dune systems that haven't had it and try and increase it on some that already do have existing grazing on. So we're going to remove uh, the scrub and, and, and rank grass, grasses. Uh, on some of the other sites in the country, the Dynamic Dunescape project is going to create notches, which are uh, sort of a V-shaped cut in the frontal area of the dunes, which will allow in the winds and the weather to, to start the sand moving again. Uh, we, we're not going to do that on some of the Cumbrian sites, but it is, is something that we're, we're proposing for 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 later capital works after as at the end of the project okay next slide please eve so yeah we'll look at these conservation actions in more detail this is this is drig dunes in cumbria where there is some grazing already but we're looking to increase the grazing um at drig there used to be a massive rabbit population and if you look on the old maps for drig and quite a few of the other coastal sand dune systems you will see the word Warren, because a lot of these areas actually in medieval times used to be managed for the rabbit population, which would provide um, the local population with a, a source of meat. This rabbit population has collapsed um, over the last 20, 30 years due to myxomatosis outbreaks and the hemorrhagic disease, which is a newer disease that rabbits are suffering from. On Drig now, there is virtually, well, no rabbit population. It's a very, very tiny compared to uh, to what it used to be. As part of the project, we're going to carry out a, a survey of the rabbit population and then repeat that at the end of the, the Dynamics Dunescapes project to see if anything has improved. OK, next slide, please, Eve. Uh, this is a, a pool on the sand dune system. And as you can see, it's scrubbing over with willow, primarily due to lack of grazing. If you had a big rabbit population on here or cattle, cattle grazing this, this area that that willow will be constantly knocked back and eaten back uh, and stopped from from taking over the pool if there isn't any grazing as at this site um this is west of airfield near north walney then the willow starts to grow and it will eventually dry the pool out and turn it into scrubby woodland as we mentioned before so part of the conservation actions of the dynamic dunescape project is to uh, remove this scrub increase the grazing and open it up these pools again, which are vital habitat for, as we mentioned, for breeding natter jacks and uh, lots of other priority species on the dunes. Okay, Eve, next slide. This is a, a pool that's been created at, uh, up at uh, Silleth on a sand dune system. Uh, and this is something we want to re replicate on some of the dynamic dunescape site. This pool was put in uh, last year, I think, uh, uh, near Silith, and immediately the Natterjacks started using it and breeding in it. So it, it just shows that there is a, a shortage of these sort of uh, warm, shallow, ephemeral pools that Natterjacks uh, prefer. And so as, as part of the project, we're going to create some new ones. OK, Eve. Other conservation actions. Uh, this is down where Sarah's at South Walney. And, and this is tur stripping, which is uh, a method used to remove the rank grassland uh, and take off the top layer of, of mineral soil that's starting to form and take it back to the bare sand 
um, that was there before, which then allows the wind in to blow the sand and, and keeps it open, but also allows the pioneer species that, that rely on bare sand uh, to move back into this area. Um, and it, yeah, it's vital, it's vital. And we saw from the, the previous slide that there's um, a lack of bare sand due to the overstabilization. Okay, Eve. This species that some of you may be familiar with is a Japanese rose, uh, Rosa rugosa. Um, it's a, a garden SKP and an, an invasive species on the dune systems. It's uh, extremely happy uh, on dune systems. It seems to do really well in the sandy soils. It's deep rooted, difficult to remove forms quite large, thick, dense clumps, and adds to the stabilization of the dune systems and the scrubbing over. So as part of the, the capital works on the Cumbria sites, we will be removing Rosa Rugosa wherever possible. And I think it's it's on every single site that, uh, that I'm dealing with. Um, so it is, yeah, it's uh, quite a, a problem that's, um, that needs that needs checking and, and sorting out otherwise it will lead to the increased stabilization of the dunes. The methods we use for that are wherever possible, we're going with mechanical digger and actually dig up the root system, which is then burnt on site. And the ash from that is then buried and covered back over with the sand. Uh, if that's not possible because of terrain or other, other, other difficulties, then it can be cut, cut by hand and, um, and then and then sprayed with herbicide, which is not the preferred preferred method really, but it is quite a successful method for treating Rosa rugosa. Okay, so in the past, public access to sand dunes was often restricted. Dunes were fenced off, boardwalks created so that people didn't step on the dunes, uh, marion grass planted uh, to stabilise dune systems. Um, and on some some sites in the past few years. The, the little bits of public access that were used were the only bits of bare sand on the whole site. So it's now been realised that this previous management management of the dunes restricting the public access was wrong. Uh, and access is really important. Um, and so as part of the Dynamic Dunescape, Dunescapes project, we'll be encouraging access and community involvement and, yeah, reversing the, the previous practices management which were have now been considered to be to be to be wrong uh, apologies for my wife I'm cracking up and, and and letting me down and i'll hand back to eve Brill, thanks for, thanks very much richard and sorry for those uh, technical difficulties for those who have joined on the talk for us today so as Richard mentioned, it's really important that we do get as many people involved in the project as possible to help the sand dune systems and to help the sustainability of the project. There's many different ways you can get involved from volunteering to getting your school group or business involved. So please do just contact me, um, sign up as a volunteer on the website, or you can also sign up for the newsletters too. And the details are just on the screen in front of you. In terms of volunteering, we, we are unable to take groups out at the moment but we are hoping that we'll be up and running as soon as possible to take part in surveying of natterjacks and um, citizen science surveys monitoring the vegetation up and down the coast there um, and, and monitoring of different species too so there will be training at the end of the year for that for the next surveying season we have just launched a new John Muir Award as well. Uh, this is a chance for families to get involved. So the John Muir Award is an award to explore, discover, conserve and share your wild places. And we have created a full activity pack for you and your family to get involved if you would like to do that with us. So thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to the talk today. Um, I'm going to open it up now for any questions that you may have for myself, Sarah or Richard. Um, if you'd like to pop them in the comment box um, just by the little speech, speech bubble on your screen and then we can answer them from there.